Begin Podfix Network transmission. In three, two, one. Whether you're fly fishing in a stream, getting those ankles wet, or deep in the ocean casting nets, fish nerds, fish nerds, fish nerds, it's a podcast. It is a podcast. Hello, Clay Groves with you today, Chief Executive Fish Nerd, Licensed Fishing Guide, your best friend. We make a show about fish, fishing, and eating fish. And today is your lucky day. We're doing another book review, and book reviews are always better when we talk to the author. So we're talking about the book, Why Sharks Matter. Now, close to being a New York Times bestseller, because it was in the New York Times just today. So really cool. Dr. David Schiffman is with me. Do I call you Doc? Doctor? What do you... Or David, whatever works for you. David seems weird after now you have a book out. I mean, that's a big deal. <laughs> By the way, first of all, congratulations. Writing a book is not Thank easy. You so much. Not an easy thing. And getting published by anybody is a challenge. So <laughs> you did it. Congratulations. That's amazing. And I was so excited when I saw this book come out. And the first thing I did was like tell you, like, I want I want you on my show. And then mm-hmm. you had your people call my people and I got a copy of the book, Why Sharks Matter. A deep dive into the world's most misunderstood predator, and uh, so let's get right into this book here. We want, or Great. I mean, people don't really care about your whole history; they can get that in the New York Times. <laughs> they, but we want to do this first of all. I, I want to talk about sharks for a few minutes, um, and you do before I even get into the book. One thing I I hate reading science books. I find them to be dull and challenging to read. I like the content. I want all that stuff in my brain, but I can't read it. This is a science book that's written like a conversation with a friend. And, oh, that's nice to hear. Yeah, Thank you. very accessible book. And you start off doing what's most important, which is trying to define what a shark is. So for our listeners who maybe it's a squishy definition, can you tell us what a shark is? Absolutely. So sharks are fish. So totally appropriate for the Fish Nerds podcast. A shark nerd is a fish nerd. And they, but they're a different group of fish from something like a salmon or a trout or a bass or a tuna or a goldfish. Those are the bony fishes. Their skeletons are made of bone, just like ours. While sharks and their relatives, the skates, the rays, and the chimeras, have skeletons that are made out of cartilage, like our, like our nose, like our ears. If you wiggle those, you can feel that it's lighter and more flexible. Their whole bodies are made out of that. So that's the main difference. They also have some other sensory abilities and physiological things that are a little different. But the main difference has to do with what their skeletons are made out of. That's, a, that's the easy difference, right? And then you get some of the biology on like how they breathe. They need to keep moving around in order to breathe, and uh, which makes it interesting. And you also talk about taxonomy, and you talked about David Starr Jordan in this book. And I read that mm-hmm. first line. I went, David Starr Jordan, I hate that guy, you know, because he's a, 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 a eugenicist. E- eugenicist? Mm-hmm. Yeah, because we had Lulu Miller on our show right. um, when her book came out, and you mentioned her book. I'm like, hey, it's like my friends are, are talking to each <laughs> other on there. So... Um, but it's, he's important in that he did the taxonomy work. So even though pretty terrible human, he still yes. did some science that carries through and still the modern of fish taxonomy, right? Yeah. Unfortunately, many uh, influential scientists have been terrible humans, and he was certainly one of them. But there's just some crazy stories about him in particular, and Lulu's book gets into that in much more detail. But the, he was the first president of Stanford University and was involved to some extent that we don't know exactly what in the mysterious disappearance of one of the Stanford family people. Well, Lulu makes uh, a case that, that he murdered the, yeah. the president. It was, it was I, one I of the presidents it. of Stanford. Yeah. So he was not, not good. And he was a, bananas. Je- yeah, he was a bananas person. So you should read, if you haven't read already, Lulu Miller's book, uh, why fish don't exist. By the way, you know how I got her on my podcast. Mm-hmm. So I, I emailed her a whole bunch of times, no response. And then I went fishing with her book and I had my kids holding a copy for a book up, holding a fish. So it said, why fish don't exist while they're holding a fish. And I kept tweeting. Mate science. I tweeted at her. Cute <laughs> kids always win. So, But, but oh, you just. That's funny. Yeah. But, but she was actually terrific. But let's talk about your book, Why Sharks Don't Matter. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm, why Sharks Don't Matter. <laughs> why, I'm, I get the, my brain hurts. Um, why Sharks Matter, deep dive into the world's most misunderstood predator. You also go back in time and talk about fishing myths throughout history, especially with shark attacks because the natural fear people seem to have is we're afraid of sharks. And I've been in shark-infested waters. I've, I've been in places where there's a shark swim past me. And even though I know the data, 
I still feel that fear. I still feel that fear. But take us through some of the data points about about shark attacks and how dangerous are sharks to humans. Yeah, well, there's that Onion article that I love about this, that sharks are, will only kill 10 people this year, but you're going to be one of them. Uh, that puts it in perspective. But generally speaking, this is just an astronomically low risk of being bitten by a shark. Hundreds of millions of humans go in the ocean every year, and 50 to 70, not 50 to 70 million, 50 to 70 are bitten by sharks, most of which have injuries so minor they need a Band-Aid, not stitches. And there, there are people who are hurt fairly significantly. There are unfortunately people who die, but more people in the United States are killed by vending machines than are killed by sharks. Well, and, and I heard, uh, I heard selfies are pretty dangerous. It was a kid Terrible. yesterday. I did yeah. a story. I, I work for the radio station. We did a story yesterday on a kid who was taking a selfie and fell a hundred feet off a cliff taking a selfie. So your selfie is probably more dangerous than a shark. Yeah, that actually happens a lot. Yeah. That people are trying to take selfies with the beautiful scenery behind them and they aren't paying attention and they fall off cliffs and they fall off mountainsides and they fall off buildings. Like, but it's great for their horrible. Instagrams. Yeah, they're, but their yes. Instagrams are perfect. So. A, a very brief but fascinating Instagram live. Yeah. So have you ever been bitten by a shark? I have not ever been bitten like, by a shark, but I have been hospitalized while doing shark research because I was insufficiently careful with the fishing here. Um, and I got a, a large 16-knot circle hook right through my hand. Um, and as near as I have been able to figure out from talking with friends at the National Marine Fisheries Service, I might be the only person that's ever happened to. Because these circle hooks are designed to be ultra safe. Mm -hmm. uh, I am in a safety training video for commercial fishermen for what not to do because of that particular adventure. That's awesome. Congratulations. I actually still have the hook in a medical waste jar on my desk. That's so cool. I, I've never had to go to a hospital for a hook, but I once brought my mother-in-law to a hospital for getting hooked. So that's, that's something. So congratulations <laughs> on there. Um, we are getting into the book here. We also talk about, Your book also gets into talking about Shark Week. Uh, you've mm -hmm. been featured on Shark Week. A lot of scientists have. Uh, you've got some issues with it? Yeah, they, uh, they're not very good at the, at the accuracy and the reality and the truth, uh, to put it mildly. I've been called Shark Week's biggest critic by a couple of publications. I'm not sure if that's true, but certainly... Well, it's a badge I, uh, of honor, though. You know, that's I'll, cool. I'll, I'll take it. Yeah. <laughs> I, I don't think anyone is more critical of them than me, but lots of people are similarly critical. Um, and it's Shark Week is the biggest stage that ocean science or conservation gets in the United States. Millions of people watch, and some of the garbage that they put on there shows that they'll watch anything, so why not put something good? There's one particular statistic. We actually just did a research project. Dr. Lisa Widenack, my friend and colleague, was the, the lead, and I was the senior author, where we had some undergraduate research assistants, undergraduate research assistants watch all of the Shark Week shows, all of them, and write down who was on it and what their job is, and what shark species were featured, and where they went, and what they said, and all that. And we're able to document pretty thoroughly that it is as bad as it seems. But one thing that's especially striking for me is among, uh, among people who have been asked to appear in more than one Shark Week episode, there are more guys named Mike who are not scientists than there are women. <laughs> my, my field is 60% women. Uh, that most of the shows take place in Mexico or South Africa or the Bahamas, and most of the people they feature are white guys. Name Mike. And name Mike. <laughs> That's really yes. funny. That's a funny data point. <laughs> uh, but it's just abject nonsense from start to finish. And it's not just the big stuff. But there's plenty of big stuff that they get very wrong. Uh, they've had fictional episodes that uh, just completely made up CGI video, Photoshopped images, actors pretending to be scientists and government officials that they don't say are fictional, but it's not just that it's the, it's the little things that they'll have a black tip shark appear and they'll say black tip sharks can get to be 14 feet long. Like, no, they can't. And they'll show a hammerhead and they'll say, this is one of 11 species of known hammerhead sharks. No, it isn't just basic stuff. They don't do the most cursory effort at fact checking. Well, you're seeing that, that you're seeing that more and more. I mean, the learning channel used to be educational. The history channel is a great example of another channel that yep. has forgotten to be educational, forgotten to fact check, and so it's really to aliens and mystical yeah. Nazis and yeah, all that good stuff. It's a real trend amongst these cable uh, companies who claim to be, you know, 
here for our education and we're really kind of pushing away from that. And that's the weird space to be with media because we believe these channels. We're going to watch Shark Week on Discovery and, and believe it because it's Discovery. Yeah. Uh, it's I, I do a lot of public talks about sharks. I speak with thousands of people a year at museums, at schools, at, at uh, zoos and aquariums. And I can't remember the last time someone didn't ask me about Megalodon uh, because they saw it on Shark Week. That Oh, I always thought this animal was extinct, but Shark Week said it's still alive and still a danger to my family. What should I do? Like, it's not. They're extinct. Don't worry about it. It's fine. Oh, you said just swim faster than Megalodon. Yeah. That's all. And, that's, and it's really easy to swim faster than Megalodon because... There's they're, no extinct. Such, they're extinct, yeah. so I can yeah, outswim a fossil. To, yeah, you don't have to outswim the shark. You just have to outswim your dive buddy is the old joke. But <laughs> uh, with megalodons, you should be pretty safe. All right, good. So And then so we, we're, and we're pretty safe in the water. We know that discovery is lying to us. Uh, but now let's get into some of the problems that sharks are facing. You start yes. off with the one everyone talks about, which is shark fins. Yes. Yeah. And there oh, is, by the way, so much by the way, before this. we get yeah, into before we get into, have you eaten shark fin soup? I have tasted it. Yeah, uh, and I, I felt like I could maybe be a better advocate if I had tried it. My understanding is it would taste exactly the same if there wasn't shark fin in it, because the shark fin part is almost texture. Mm-hmm. It's it's treated in such a way that it turns into a noodle like substance. The serratotrichia, the cartilage fin rays that are in there. There's no shark meat in it. It's just. Uh, the, these fin elements from the fin. Um, so it's a very flavorful soup that has nothing to do with the fins. It's, it's a spiced chicken type broth or mm-hmm. mushroom type broth. And you know, I love those. Uh, <laughs> but you can do I, it without the fin. To eat. Yeah. yeah. All right. So let's get more into that shark fin. You're about to go on to. A... Yeah. So there's a lot of public misconception about what shark finning is and isn't. Uh, there are people who are well-intentioned but misinformed. They maybe watch a documentary that's not especially accurate, which may or may not be on Shark Week, and then they get all fired up and want to help. Uh, Or there are people who are out there lying to you in order to get social media clout or your donations about what these things are. But at the end of the day, shark finning does not mean what most people think it does. It refers to a fisherman catching a shark, cutting the fins off of that shark at sea, and dumping the body at sea. Right, so if they eat that, the shark, it's not finned, it's just Yeah, if, food. The, if the body makes it to land, then that shark has not been finned, which doesn't mean it's not dead, which doesn't mean its fins aren't used in shark fin soup. But shark finning is a specific fishing practice, and notably one that has been illegal in the United States for almost 30 years. So I see these petitions all the time that go viral on social media that someone who doesn't know what they're talking about made a change.org petition that says, ban shark finning in Florida and we did 29 years ago before already, you were born. Already there. It's really important that people, before you start a, uh, a cause, make sure that cause isn't already underway. You can just join something. You can just get, get on the bus that's already moving in that direction and help out rather than splinter off all the money or splinter off the groups. So it's, it's important. Now, I have a regret. I did not, I, I once killed a Mako shark, a 240 pound short fin Mako off the coast of Maine. I went out mm-hmm. with uh, the Fish Nerds podcast. We were recording a live show on a shark fishing boat. And I checked with, with uh, Maine fishing game biologists before we left because I was into sustainable fishing. And so I'm trying to make sure that I'm not doing anything that's bad. And I, of course, yeah. you, so I asked them and they said, nope, uh, Makos are sustainable. Go for it. Eat, eat a Mako. It's totally okay. And uh, what, I, what, what they were telling me was it's legal. <laughs> right. They didn't mean they didn't know sustainable. And so I went, okay, great. We went out. We caught this 240 pound Mako shark. That's a big fish. It was a big fish. Took a long time to catch. It was very exciting. Um, the, we, we killed it. We tipped the, the harbor master with 10 pounds of shark meat. I filled a cooler with shark meat. The whole thing got eaten. Uh, and I even tipped at the bar after with five pounds of shark meat. They were thrilled. Uh, but you know, we did not eat the fins. Yep. We, and I wish I had taken the chance to at least make a shark fin soup out of that so I can taste it. But then the very next day, I got invited to go on um, Boston Public Radio. And we brought Mako Shark f- with us. And we, we ate it on air with, with the host of that public radio show. And I got my first hate mail. Like yeah. scientists and biologists and conservationists all coming after the fish nerds. And all we could do was like, well, 
we asked. <laughs> we yeah. So can you tell us the problem? Like, why is the messaging different from like the red list, from biologists and from states? Like what's going on there? Yeah. So relatively recent data has shown that North Atlantic shortfin mako sharks are in much bigger trouble than we used to think they were. And they've been reassessed as endangered by the IUCN red list in the last five years or so. Um, so they were not, they were of some conservation concern before that, but a series of new papers came out relatively recently that went, oh my God, something's going on here and we need to act. Uh, but the IUCN Red List is an international group of scientific experts that they use this uh, open source criteria. The deal is that anyone analyzing them using the same data will get the same results. But it's not um, – an IUCN Red List assessment of endangered does not inherently carry the force of law. Uh, it's just a scientific recommendation, and the U.S. government uh, does not use Red List assessment. Is there a reason why? Does it have to do with money, or what's the – why won't they? Why can't we just agree on something and just go with it? Oh, if we could get scientists and managers to agree on things, my life would be a lot more boring. Uh, the I'm not sure exactly why, but there's some uh, there's some mistrust and misunderstanding between different groups working towards the same goal. Uh, there's there's a lot of confusion among fishery scientists about what red list data means and doesn't mean, and I've I've heard people say. Um, the the red list says that if you have a 50% population decline, you're critically endangered, but that's the goal of maximum sustainable yield is to create a 50% population decline. That's, that's not what that means. Mm. It would have to be in a particular time frame uh, with the, with still declining. So a lot of it is just some people are just factually wrong about what terms mean. Uh, and it's, there's that old cliche that it's very difficult to convince some point, someone of something if their job depends on them not understanding it. Uh, so I, I'll, I'll tell you, I work for the, the Red List tuna and billfish team. I've, I'm not part of the shark team, but it's the same, same criteria, same documents, same assessments and stuff like this. But generally, the United States does a very good job managing our shark fisheries. Most of the most sustainable shark fisheries are here. Others are in, the, are in Australia, New Zealand, and Canada. Okay, so so I, I was I, was I wrong to check with the biologist first, or should I have called you next? No, time? no, <laughs> no I, I, I get questions like that all the time, and yeah. I'm always happy to help. But yeah, you did the right thing to check because yeah. certainly there are some charter fishermen that uh, push the boundaries of rules, especially if there's there's potential media coverage for them involved. Right, which what makes it's weird to me if you get media coverage and you're breaking the rules, it's a pretty public way to you would think to break the rules. So it, it's crazy. So can we talk about? Um, about fishing for sharks, recreational and commercial fishing for sharks. Uh, let's start sure. with commercial fishing. Is there is there a market for commercial fish sh- sharks? There is. Um, and the U.S. is one of the largest commercial fishing nations for sharks in the world, one of the top ten. Uh, and we export both fins and meat. Uh, a lot of people who are sort of casual shark conservationists who know a little bit about it have heard of the fins but haven't heard of the meat. And that's a larger and growing issue, especially here. Uh, shark meat is consumed uh, in Europe, in, in North America, in South America. The fins are primarily consumed as part of the shark fin soup, which is a, a traditional Chinese and Southeast Asian delicacy and in those diaspora communities around the world. Uh, so there are a lot of sort of casual environmentalists who love to demonize China and Japan and don't say anything about Spain and Portugal and how they overfish mako sharks. Uh, if that's you, then you're not interested in helping sharks. You're interested in yelling at Asian people, right? Which is important. We don't we don't we don't get to that level because it is a bigger problem. And the, you know, that problem is that shark tastes good, and that's <laughs> like if they yeah, didn't taste you know, good, right? we wouldn't be talking about this, right? It's, yeah. yeah. You know how like ninety nine percent of fish are described as a flaky white fish, not mm-hmm. too fishy. It's not that. No, so if that's, what, if that's what you want. Then this shark is not good for you. It's kind of groupery. Mm. Uh, it's a, a richer, more I think, more interesting flavor. Yeah, Mako. Um, absolutely. Yeah, go ahead. Mako reminded me that of like the texture of a pork chop, but like a little sweetness to it, and like way better tasting than swordfish, which I don't eat anymore either. But um, I, you know, I I can see the attraction to it. Now, when we talk sustainable fishing, years ago, 2011, I did a lot of stuff stories on on 
on sustainable fishing, trying to get people away from eating large fish and go for maybe under eaten fish or small fish, eating bait fish, for example. And dogfish was a trend in the sustainable fishing world. Uh, the spiny dogfish um, here in New England was really popular. And we're told that's been used in fish and ships around the world. Um, local, I know cod fishermen up here, when they catch them, they kill them. It just They just kill them and throw them back in the ocean because yeah, they hate they, them. Cod and lobster guys tend to hate mm-hmm. the dogfish. Now, is eating dogfish sustainable or is that something that's been kind of going through the world of sustainable fishing for years and there's not, you know. The U.S. caught dogfish is pretty good and uh, British Columbia caught dogfish you, was the, actually the first MSC certified sustainable shark fishery anywhere in the world. I did some of my postdoc research on that fishery. Uh, they've since largely shut down because it's for a lot of reasons, but unrelated to the sustainability of the fish. Uh, it can be sustainable. It is uh, uh, the ones caught in Europe are problematic, but our stocks off the east coast of the U.S. are pretty well managed. Uh, actually, S- Senator Elizabeth Warren. Uh, has been trying to get the USDA to, they have a program to buy underutilized agricultural products and and sell them for cheap in school lunches. And she's been trying to get the USDA to do that with, with Cape Cod dogfish. Right. And, and I understand like in uh, in England and parts of Europe, dogfish is often what we see in fish and chips. Is yes. That, is that right? Be, yeah. Uh, it's cheap and it has a good texture for frying. It doesn't fall, crumble and fall apart like some things. Uh, if you see on a menu rock salmon, there's no such thing as a rock salmon. That's a spiny dogfish, or sometimes a smooth dogfish. Oh, the smooth, yeah, the smooth ones are bigger, right? Is that, yes, yeah. I, I've never seen a smooth one. I've caught spiny dogfish, and typically the commercial guys say you don't catch one spiny dogfish. They move in what I would call a school, and what I've heard uh, New England cod guys call a swarm. Of uh, many, many of them, you could put out you could put out a hundred hooks and catch eighty five, uh, which you don't typically get with sharks. Yeah, I once entered a charter. I was on a charter fishing boat for um, haddock fishing, and we caught a spiny dogfish. And the captain of the boat freaked out and, uh, in a very vicious, mean way, killed the dogfish. And I ended the trip early. I said, "Get me off your boat and take me back. This is done." And I, I couldn't even. I couldn't fathom treating the animal the way he tra- treated that animal. So I was, yeah. I, I would have been fine. I, I wanted, to, I would have eaten it, you know. But, but the way he destroyed that fish was it's just, just uncomfortable. It's uncomfortable. It's mean, and yeah. it, it doesn't make any sense to me. So, um, so, so when people fish for sharks, the the commercial industry is it hook and line primarily, or is it big nets? And let's talk about maybe bigger sharks. Are. Yeah, long lines are very common. The same type of thing that are used for the the big tunas and swordfish. Uh, and mahi mahi, and the, so bycatch is a problem as well as targeted catch for sharks. Uh, there are gillnet fisheries for sharks. Yeah, I guess you could trawl for them if you were driving the boat really fast, but I don't know of that happening a ton. Uh, right. And lots of tuna per seine fisheries catch sharks as bycatch, uh, which may or may not also be sold. Right, which could be so. And so that's commercial, and they're catching you know tons of fish and killing them that way. And so I was thinking, like, boy, like one guy with a fishing rod, what's the problem? Like mm-hmm. I'm not going to hurt the I'm not going to hurt the f- population. Then I read your book and I started going, well, maybe I can. Tell me, tell me about yeah. recreational angling and sharks. So there's been this emerging uh, recognition that recreational fisheries can be a conservation issue for some populations of some species. And the, as you as you say, people when they hear that they say, well, I'm just one person with a rod and reel. A great day for me is when I catch three fish. How can I be having an impact on the scale of these super trawlers or whatever? And the answer is because it's not just you. It's there's tens of millions of people doing that. And there's not that many super trawlers, but also a few more things. The economics are different. Uh, it, It is unlikely that a commercial fishery will drive a fish extinct. They certainly can have major conservation impacts. But when there's only a few left, you won't make enough money by going out to catch them to pay for your fuel and your crew. So you won't drive a fish extinct, but recreational fishing, you're paying to go do it and rarer fish are more valuable. So you pay more. Also, there are some species of fish whose populations are so low that commercial fishing for them is banned, but recreational fishing is still allowed. So there's been this emerging consensus that for some populations that are already really threatened, 
recreational fishing can be a big problem. And this was what a lot of my PhD work was on, on recreational fishing for big sharks in Florida. And we, we discovered that these people uh, tend to be very, very different from the typical recreational angler um, in both demographics and in their goals and attitudes. We're talking about the difference between going deer hunting in the woods with your family and friends uh, near your house versus traveling halfway around the world to hunt an endangered rhino or something. Right. They're big game uh, hunters. Are, yeah. It's a big game hunter mentality. Yeah. Exactly. They don't eat the shark. They're not just going fishing to have a nice day on the water away from the hustle and bustle of the big city. They're, they want the big game, the big game experience, and they want their photo with the giant dead shark. And then they, then they get rid of it. Yeah, which is awful. Terrible. So, so recreational anglers are having an impact. So it's important to think, to think about volume of people. And I guess since 2020 with the pandemic, the amount of people fishing has increased by like 25 or 30%. So it's a yes. bigger problem than we think. So Yeah. And it's, it's great that people are getting outside. It's great that people are connecting with nature. Uh, your, impa- your actions have an impact and just be a little thoughtful and be careful. Okay, so we can we can still do it, but be careful and be be thoughtful. All right, so um, so those are two big issues, and then I was surprised to find that climate change was not a big problem for your, most of your sharks that you've been studying, because I was yeah. thinking climate change has to be killing these sharks, and yeah, climate is bad news for a lot of things, uh, and we absolutely should tackle that. But generally speaking, for sharks, it's just not considered that big a deal because most of them can just sort of move. Uh, and we're starting to see that. I was, I was a co-author on a paper that found this expansion of bull sharks into the Outer Banks of North Carolina, uh, that they have record scientific sampling records going back to the 1960s, and they used to never catch baby bull sharks out there. And since 2000, 2001, they catch a ton of them every year. And that's because they, it used to be the bull shark nursery area was about North Florida. And now the waters of the Outer Banks are as warm as they used to be off North Florida, and it's habitat for bull sharks. So if where you are, it gets too hot, you can just move north uh, in our hemisphere, and then it's cooler. Bigger animals can do that, but it's still ecologically disruptive for sure. But the number one threat to sharks by far is overfishing. Climate is extremely minor compared to that in terms of number of species affected. Right, and you even got into microplastics on here as not being the big problem for sharks either. Yeah, if we totally solve the plastic pollution crisis, which we should do, it's bad for a lot of things. But if we totally solve the plastic pollution crisis and don't solve overfishing, sharks are still in trouble. If we totally solve overfishing and don't solve the plastic pollution crisis or climate change, sharks are going to be doing a lot better than they are now. Right. And I guess these these, those two issues can distract us from the goal of shark conservation because we think... We think we're saving everything by solving those two problems, but those aren't the, the two big ones for the sharks. Yeah. Yeah. My friend, Doc Martin, I mean, do, you know, do you know Doc, Doc Martin from yeah. Emporia State University? Because mm-hmm. uh, she, does, she does all kinds of studies on microplastics, so she'll be interested in that conversation. I think you're going out there in the fall. I, think I, I am. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, so I'm about to go on this, this big book tour. Uh, and one of the stops is going to be Emporia State that she reached out and was able to set that up. Yeah, I'm, I'm, cool. I'm trying to get out there for that, too. So we can we can do some stuff while we're out there. Have some fun. Awesome. Maybe you can go shark fishing in Kansas. So, <laughs> <laughs> All right. So let's let's move into, OK, we, we know the problem is fishing. So is the problem we go all the way like the Sea Spiracy movie and just stop eating oceans, animals out of the ocean? Or what's what do we do? How do we how do we help these sharks? So if, if people want to become vegan, uh, they can, but we're absolutely, and that's, a, you know, it's a valid choice for a lot of reasons. Sure. I'm not, uh, the, but we're, we're absolutely not at the point where the science says everyone has to go vegan or else the oceans are doomed as people in, in movies like Seaspiracy claim. It's just, it's just not true. No. Hey, by the way, uh, it would work, that utopian planet. It would, it would, it would yeah. save the sharks. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> So the problem is is overfishing. We're killing too many sharks. And the solution to overfishing is better fisheries management. And this is what this is a, a fascinating um, dichotomy in that I when I talk to scientific experts and managers and conservationists, everyone's talking about making fisheries more sustainable. And when I talk to just the public on social media, everyone says, well, obviously we have to ban everything. And that inspired years of my research. 
that what why is everyone hearing things that are so different from how the experts talk about this? And yeah, so the answer is the answer supported by 90% of scientists that I surveyed and 78% of environmentalists that I surveyed is not bans, but more sustainable fisheries management whenever yeah. possible. And can you can you define sustainable? That's a really tough one. Um, according to the Seaspiracy movie. There's no, it doesn't mean anything. It's well, just a buzzword. Actually, oh if, you, if you watch the movie and listen closely, he says that three or four times. At the very end, he says, he says, there's no such thing as sustainability. All they want to do is make sure there's enough fish in the ocean that you can eat them, and then they keep living, and you do it again. I'm like, well, that's like, yes. just to find it. <laughs> so, yeah, that's, that's correct. Yeah. Uh, so I, there are a lot of definitions. I work uh, part-time with the Marine Stewardship Council, which we have a, one of the leading definitions for it. That's the, the, blue, the blue fish check mark that you see on some seafood products. And generally what we're, the definitions vary, but generally what we're talking about is rules that limit how many fish can be taken. So the goal is taking so few that they can be replaced by the fish that you leave having babies. Fishing gear and fishing practices that don't damage the habitat or cause significant bycatch. Rules in place to enforce all of this and regularly updating the rules with new science is generally what we're talking about. Right. And so, so that's all it has to do with policy making and stuff like that. What can, yep. what can the average fisher do? Like, I want to go fishing. What can I do to help? Yeah, just following the rules and calling out your friends that are skeptical of, about the rules makes a big difference. Participating in the management discussions, especially if you're a fisher in the United States, we have a very active participatory uh, regulatory structure. That means the government really cares what you think and really listens and really gives you opportunities to share it. And if you're concerned that some, that you're seeing bad practices happening or your things ain't what they used to be and it used to be so easy to catch something and now it's not, speak up and we'll listen. Yeah, simple as that. And, you know, educate yourself. Read the book, Why Sharks Matter, because it's all, it's all in the book there, really well laid out. And again, the readability of this book is what makes it for me. This was a book that I, I'm able to read and understand your explanations in the book, your, your definitions, you even clarified fish versus fishes for me. For years, I've been getting that wrong. And so that helps, that helps a lot. Um, so as we get through the book here, you know, you, you kind of come into like a whole list of things that people can do. And one of the things, of course, is getting involved with stuff. And the other one, I, my favorite was don't start your own nonprofit <laughs> was when you. Oh, my God. Let's talk about that. Yeah. yeah. So I get I get emails all the time from social media people. If you it used to be that if you Googled shark scientist, I was one of the first people that popped up. What's going to get? Because I'm the best shark scientist. It says right on the book, best shark kind yeah. scientist. Yeah. So, oh no. Yeah. Uh, but it's because I do a lot of social media stuff. So just Google Pay Drink bump, bump me up there, and I get weird questions. But a question that I get a lot was something like, "I just watched Seaspiracy or some bad movie full of wrong information like that, and I want to help. So I'm starting my own nonprofit to save the sharks. What should I do?" And my answer is, if you if you don't know what you're supposed to do, maybe don't start your own nonprofit and maybe volunteer to help with the existing nonprofits. Right. And there are so many people who would rather be the president of the Silver Spring Save the Sharks Club that doesn't do anything than be a, an anonymous, faceless volunteer actually helping a real group to do things. And if that's you, you're not interested in helping. You're interested in fame and praise. Right. Stroke your own ego. We don't need more people interested in fame and praise. We need people willing to help. Right. Plus, uh, running a real nonprofit that really manages it's things. And it's boring. terrible. Yeah, I've done it. It's off. I've been grant writing. It's, it's terrible work. So if you've got the skills, partner with someone who already knows what they're doing. And I think you're right, though. If you ask the question, you know, like, you know, you have those kind of questions. Like, you're not qualified to run a shark conservation yeah. um, organization. Yeah. That doesn't mean you're a bad person. Yes, and it, it doesn't does. mean there's nothing you can do. <laughs> Some of them might be. Uh, and it doesn't mean that you, there's nothing you can do to help. It just means if you don't know what you're talking about and you don't have relevant education or advocacy experience or managerial experience or lobbying experience or policy or law experience, then maybe you shouldn't be leading the charge and you should be offering support behind the scenes. 
Well, I think that's I think that's good. I think you I think you nailed it there. So your book is Why Sharks Matter: A Deep Dive with the World's Most Misunderstood Predator. This came out this week. It's already mm-hmm. topping the best selling list on Amazon. You're going to be with your New York Times article. That's going to not hurt you at all. So, and you're oh, about man. to. You're, isn't that cool? The reception has just been so wonderful. Mm-hmm. You know, you write these things, and you have friends take a look at things, and they say, "Yeah, this is good," but you know, it's different from when the public sees it. It's the reception has been wonderful. And the New York Times is no yes. joke. I mean, that's the paper of record right there. And if, if yeah, that's uh, going to that le- review that review made my mom cry. Oh yeah, well, I mean, I just I, t- I talked to you on the internet. But I've never talked to you in person, and I was like, kind of so mm-hmm. proud of you. I'm like, wow, man, right on, dog, you did. Congratulations. That's cool. And you're embarking on a book tour, which is like a dream thing to do, right? Yeah. I'm going to be, as of this recording, we're at 27 cities in four countries, uh, all arranged by me via social media. So if anyone out there is listening, wants to have someone come talk about sharks in your community, if you can get me there, I'm happy to come. Uh, And I'm partnering mostly with zoos and aquariums and science museums. I can also do libraries or indie bookstores, uh, universities, Whatever. Love to come talk to you about sharks. So you're available to do that. So if I want to get you up here to the, we have an aquarium up here. Maybe I can get them to have you up. Where, where are you again? I'm in the White me. Mountains of New Hampshire. So we're oh, cool. way up I, north. I have uh, Connecticut and Massachusetts coming up. Oh, do you? So not so, too far. Let me let me look and see what we can do. I probably yeah. can't do anything, but we'll, <laughs> we'll see if we can do it. But your book again is Why Sharks Matter. It's available in bookstores now. It's available on Amazon. Do you have a website, David? Uh, I do. Uh, it's whysharksmatter.com. That's info about it. And I'm, <laughs> my, my Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram are Why Sharks Matter. And for those of you who have been social media followers for a while, uh, I've actually had the name of the book in my head since before I had my social media handles. So I've been writing this book for a very long time, and it's it's uh, pretty cool to see it come out. I know. Now, um, your friends and family must be like super excited for you too, right? They're going to get to watch you yeah. kind of become all of a sudden this world-renowned shark guy. You just... You're going to be the guy. (laughs) That's wild. Well, David Schiffman, congratulations. I really appreciate you. Thank you you so much. I appreciate you making time for us. Thank you for sending me this book. And I am definitely going to work with Doc to try, Doc Martin, to see if I can get out to Kansas when you get out to Emporia. You're going to love. That'd be awesome. Have you met her before? Just over the phone and Zoom and such. Yeah, she's she's wonderful. You're going to, you're going to just like, I've known her since 2011 when the podcast Mm -hmm. first started. She was a grad student and she's been with us since we since the very very beginning she's one of our, our science correspondents so you're gonna you're gonna just like working with her a lot and uh, have a ton of fun and enjoy every minute of this book tour you've totally earned it um thank you and i'm proud of you i'm excited for you so thank you so much david Schiffman, author of why sharks matter deep dive with the world's most misunderstood predator links at fishners.com to buy your copy and you should buy it because david's going on a book tour and he can't afford to keep going if you don't give him money <laughs> <laughs> All right, David, any any final words? Uh, Just if anyone has any questions about sharks, I am always happy to answer them for you. Uh, Just find me on social media, Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram at Why Sharks Matter. I'm going to close this show out. So that's it. You've listened to a couple of fish nerds when you should have been fishing, but not for sharks. Uh, (laughs) Special thanks to... uh, to David Schiffman for coming on here and being part of this. Thanks to our families for letting us be fish nerds when we definitely should be spending more time with them. And thanks to Wally Pleasant for doing our theme music. And again, get your copy of Why Sharks Matter uh, today because it's going to be a bestseller and you can see David Schiffman on tour. So until next time, follow the code of the fish nerds, spawn early and often, never trust a free lunch with strings attached, and swim against the current every chance you get. And we did it. We made a podcast. Whether you're fly fishing in a stream, getting those ankles wet, or deep in the ocean casting nets, fish nerds, fish nerds, fish nerds, it's a podcast. Just for the hell of it! Fried in a basket or broiled in a pan, eat it raw like you're in Siam, fish nerds, fish nerds, fish nerds. It's a podcast. All right, that's it. Now we're done making a podcast.